If you clicked on this video, I'm guessing you're one of the people that's already aware that there's modern-ish web browsers for PowerPC OS X. That is, they are forks of a very old copy of Firefox for 10.4 Tiger and 10.5 Leopard. These browsers include ones like 10.4 Fox and Interweb PowerPC. They work by grafting on modern-ish features into the web browser, and they have limited support. They can kind of surf the modern internet with a lot of asterisks and caveats. You'll experience crashes and weird behavior in general. But what if we were able to run modern Firefox on a modern computer, but do it through a native-like experience in OS X? I really like Raspberry Pi 5s, and I recently got a Raspberry Pi 5 with 8GB of RAM to compile ARM64 code for Debian Linux. But what if I told you we can use this as a proxy so we can surf the modern internet from a PowerPC Power Mac G4, and it works surprisingly well. Before we get further, I want to upgrade my Raspberry Pi 5 with an NVMe SSD. I just happen to have this Rico 512GB SSD that I can't recall if I bought or they sent it to me. But I found this particular model, the E7400, to be exceptionally forgiving. I'm pretty sure I had this particular SSD in a MacBook Pro for a bit. I've read that Raspberry Pis sometimes don't like certain NVMe drives, so I'm hoping this one's safe. I used Jeff Geerling's video on enabling NVMe drives as my jump off point, and since he made it, it's gotten easier. So I'm about to do a speed run on setting up an NVMe SSD on a Pi 5. By far the most complicated step is just connecting the NVMe. I bought a generic hat on Amazon, and I'll have it linked in the description, but I bought it because of the price and the reviews didn't seem horribly bought it. I think I paid all of $11 for this. The first order of business with the hat is to mount it, and this one has stands, which makes it pretty easy to install. One nice thing about this board is the data cable comes pre-mounted, and it comes with an extra one just in case. These cables are directional, so this takes away some of the guesswork. The biggest pain of this entire process is plugging in this cable, as it's extremely tedious. I ended up popping off the clip that mounts it, and then using a pair of tweezers to stick it in, and then just putting the clip back on. I was really worried that I hadn't seed the cable properly, but when I booted up my Pi, I was able to see the SSD. Since I already had Raspberry Pi OS installed on a micro SD card, I just used the imager software from the OS and then installed it onto my SSD. There is one minor gotcha. When I first tried this, I was connected to my Anchor Power Brick and it failed. I'm not sure where I picked up this next tidbit of info, but it's probably just video or his blog post. But I read that sometimes the increased power draw of an NVMe drive can cause some issues. So I switched to a power cable that came with my Raspberry Pi 5. It's just a 5 volt, 5 amp, 27 watt power brick. Sure enough, that worked and I was able to install it. Then from the Raspberry Pi config, I set the boot order to NVMe first, then micro SD. And it worked first boot. This isn't always the case for me, so I was pretty happy with this. Then I ran Pi benchmarks and got a respectable, but not very fast, 400 megabytes a second. The Raspberry Pi 5 only has one PCIe lane exposed via the data cable. By default, it runs at PCI 2.0 speeds, but it can be configured to run at PCI 3.0 speeds, effectively doubling the speed. Following Jeff's guide, I went to modify the PCIe bus speed from 2.0 to 3.0, and in the terminal, it informed me that the config had moved. Easy enough. I went to the new location and copied over the config flags and just rebooted. Running the benchmarks again, my Raspberry Pi 5 is now getting 800 megabytes a second. While the SSD might come off as overkill, there's a good reason to use an SSD over a micro SD card. Micro SD cards aren't nearly as fast, especially in latency, but also they don't have the advanced caching and wear leveling that SSD has, thus they're not nearly as reliable. Okay, with that out of the way, we can start installing X11 and Firefox on our Raspberry Pi. And of course, all the commands you see in this video will be found in the description and an accompanying blog post in the description as well and in a pinned comment. Let's run sudo apt update and sudo apt install dash y Firefox-ESR, x11-apps, x11-utils. I suppose I should explain how this whole thing's going to work. X11 will be the thing that makes the whole thing go. To directly quote Wikipedia, X is an architecture independent system for remote graphical user interfaces and input device capabilities. Each person using a network terminal has the ability to interact with the display, with any type of user input device. On the Mac side of things, I'm using 10.5 Leopard on my Power Mac G4. 
It came pre-installed with X11, but it was out of date, and I mean this insofar as there are newer versions of it for PowerPC Max. This is important. Version 2.2 or whatever came pre-installed on Leopard does not work with my Raspberry Pi. To make this confusing, X11 was replaced with Xquartz. I downloaded and installed Xquart 2.6.1, which appears to be the last release for Leopard. Then I just launched Xquartz. From the Xterm terminal, not to be confused with your Mac's native terminal, you'll need to go to Preferences to open connections. We could try and be more secure here, but let's be real. This is my own network and this is a very out of date computer. So in the export preferences, I'm going to make sure that security has allowed connections from network clients checked. Then I'm going to go to my OS 10 preferences and make sure that my firewall has been disabled. Finally, from the Xterm terminal, I'm going to run Xhost space plus. By default, X11 runs on port 6000 or 6001, and we need to make sure it's reading it. So we're gonna run a net stat from the Xterm terminal with this following command. I was gonna read this big gnarly command out loud, but here it is on screen. This will show us what port we're listening to. This is important information. If you see 6000, that will be port number zero when we get to the Raspberry Pi. And if it's 6001, it will be one and so on. This is a virtual display number. X11 crashed a few times when I was trying to set this up and each time it crashed, it continued to occupy a port. If you see a port higher than 6001 because of this, just reboot because it causes a lot of issues. Before I move on, I need to know my Mac's IP address. So I'm gonna just go to System Press because that's the easiest place to find it. From the Raspberry Pi, I want to confirm that I can connect to my Mac. So I'm going to run nc space dash vz, then my Mac's IP, and then space port number. This command should pretty much instantly print results. If it doesn't and it times out, you have an issue. Now it's time for one more test from the Raspberry Pi. So we're going to do display equals IP address, and this is where that virtual display number comes in. Port 6000 equals zero, and port 6001 equals one. Then space xdpy info space pipe space head. It should return data that looks fairly similar to what I have on screen. If you've gotten this far, you're almost done. Let's do one last final test to see if we can display something on our Mac. We're going to run display equals your max IP followed by that virtual display number space X clock. Back on our Mac, we can see that we have a clock app being displayed. Back on my Raspberry Pi 5, I'm going to hit control C to cancel the clock app. And then I'm going to copy and paste this big gnarly command. This is our grand finale. Let's break down this command really quickly. Dash dash new instance dash dash remote plus moz underscore dbus underscore remote equals zero prevents Firefox from reusing an existing local GUI instance. And gdk underscore backend equals x11 and moz underscore disable underscore wayland equals one forces x11. And of course display equals is your max IP and its virtual display number. This should launch the Firefox GUI on your Mac. The first web page I'm going to try and load is the Raspberry Pi homepage. And of course, it renders properly. Next, I'm going to YouTube and checking out my own YouTube channel. And that too works. I can even play video, albeit it's very choppy because this isn't designed for streaming video, but it works. Even crazier is you can even make it full screen and it doesn't crash. It's even choppier, but that's besides the point. I'm going to try something more challenging. Go to codepen.io. All right, I'm going to try and type hello world. And yeah, it's working here too. Let's set the color of the text and there it goes. It's blue. All right, it's time to push the limits and see if we can really take this to the next level and run Doom 2 in a web browser. Archive.org has Doom 2 hosted with DOSBox. I'm not going to do any edits so we can see how long this takes to load. I assume I'm slightly handicapping my Raspberry Pi by not having it on a wired network. X11 can be pretty chatty. I want to break my luck here, so let's see if it loads the demo in Doom 2 because I think it goes pretty quick. I really don't expect this to be a good experience. This is without a doubt not what X11 was meant for. And sure enough, it works. All right, it's pretty much a slideshow and not very responsive, but it works. While I struggle to play the game, I think we should talk about what's happening here. We already know that Firefox is running on the Pi, but the Mac is running a X11 server, which is handling the management of Windows, drawing pixels, and the keyboard and mouse input. 
X11 doesn't stream a video of the window like VNC. Instead, it sends things like create a window here, draw text there, render this image, handle that button click, and it sends the keyboard commands and mouse events back. We can do this for other apps, and it doesn't have to be a Raspberry Pi as our host. I just find it amusing that we're using a $100 tiny computer that consumes about 1 30th the power of a dual Power Mac G4. These things are just so fun. In a weird sort of way, the Raspberry Pi being ARM-based, thus RISC, is closer in DNA to a Power Mac G4 than, say, a AMD or Intel CPU. The Raspberry Pi 5 is kind of a performance beast, too. It's about 8 to 10 times as powerful as my dual 1.4 GHz Power Mac. The way I guesstimated this is I found that the Raspberry Pi 4 in Geekbench 2 is about 4 times as fast as the dual G4, and the Raspberry Pi 5 is about 2.2 times as fast as the Pi 4 in Geekbench 6, so 4 times 2.2 gives me 8.8. .8. This should not be surprising as we're comparing a Mac released in 2003 against a computer released in 2023, literally two decades between these very different computers. You can even take this further with X11 and launch it from your PowerPC Mac. I created a shell script that uses OpenSSH. Running this script opens X11 and creates the connection to my Mac. My example will be in my blog post as well. As I record this, as we enter 2026, it's pretty easy to be doom and gloom about technology. Be it the in-shitification of the internet, everything turning into a subscription service, AI just kind of ruining everything, RAM prices just going through the roof, completely insane political stuff and tariffs. We don't need to go into that, just making things even further unobtainable. It's really nice to know that there's some little positives out there. You can buy a $100 little computer, connect it to a 23-year-old computer, and then have the modern internet on it. I, it's senseless, it doesn't do anything super productive, but it's just cool, and I just wanted to share that with everybody. So I'm trying to be upbeat in some of these videos now because I feel like things are just not going to be amazing for a while and you don't need to hear it from me at every video. You'll probably see some new stuff coming from me also as I transform to do a little more consumer rights activism. So look for that in the future. Thanks for watching. My name's Greg. I hope you have a beautiful new year and yeah, that's about it. Thanks to my Patreons.